All right, give yourselves a hand. We're here. Hey, hey. So good to see you all. Wow. The moat and, and the beam. Do you all get that one? How many watch that? All right. How many were blessed by that? Now, what was it? Did you all read the mot and the mot? The moat and the beam before and seen it in the Bible? Right? And you read it and you grabbed the concordance and you grabbed the Bible. And like, oh, all right, so whatever. Right? But do you see how the more you understand, the more deeper the meaning? Now we're going to cover some another aspect. We're going to take one verse and we're going to break it down and we're going to use the Bible to interpret what? Which is totally revolutionary. But that's how it works. The Bible interprets itself. God doesn't need an interpreter. He does it himself. And the translators, some of them need to be spanked, but that's beside the point. We're going to find out how this all works. And I'm going to put you to the test. I'm going to ask you, what do you see that doesn't fit? So, Father, I thank you right now for the greatness of your word. And I thank you for your blessings upon each person here, for their commitment to you, for their growth and development. For the, Father, you be there with them at every moment and every challenge. And I thank you for that other, that third alternative that's always there. That you, Father, can open the door and open their eyes to see it so that they can walk out on the greatness of your truth, your greater perception, that we may truly glorify you just as your firstborn from the dead are risen and return, Lord Jesus, your anointed. Okay, so now what I wanted to, to do is dance for you. No, I'm just joking. Right, this is all about the true way of what? Life, right? Okay, there's, but when we try and get to the Bible, we have a little problem. Now, there's a word called sealed, right? How many of you have ever sealed an envelope, right? If you, how many of you have ever sealed an envelope, right? The answer is no, you didn't. You thought you did, but if you use the Bible's word, you never sealed an envelope. You never did, because we don't understand what this is. And a lot of people think it's like sealing an envelope or sealing, like if you're canning vegetables and you make a seal. That's not what this is all about. What isn't it about canning? No, that's not what this is about, right? It's not sealing, right? The problem is we try and interpret the Bible from our perspective. And every time we do, we botch it, we destroy it, we corrupt it, we damage it, we steal from God. So we're not going to do that anymore. So there's some basic premises we need to understand. Number one, it's not our culture. Number two, they don't do the things we do. Number three, they don't have the same priorities we have. Number four, they don't see life the same way we have been brought up to see it. And if we're going to understand God, God gave his word to those people and not to us. Have you noticed? So we need to change and adapt more like from their perspective. That doesn't mean we're going to walk around with, you know, turbans and, you know, not something I'm talking about. But what I am talking about is perceiving that which no one else sees. Is that making sense? So just like I did with mot, with mot, with moat and beam, even though you saw the word beam, you all thought it was something like in a, in a construction, a beam. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a pillar, right? That you get caught behind when you go to the synagogue. All right, so what is that? Frank, it's a burrito. No, it's not a burrito. Well, does anyone know what this is? It's a sealed scroll. If you find this in the antiquities market, it's a sealed scroll. More than likely, what this is, is it's made from, um, uh, it's a reed that grows, it's a papyrus, it's a papyrus, and there are bulai, which is called bulai, which is where someone put a piece of clay, and they usually have a ring, a signet ring, and they pressed into it, and there were three different people that witnessed this, verifying that it is accurate and is true. Not today's day, but this is when it was written. And these are people of authority. We have, a, when you walk into a place, they say, okay, let me see your what? ID. ID, right? Well, if you're back in the Bible times, even the Roman times, even Byzant Byzantium times, even as far as the 17th century and 18th century, they want to see your signet ring. Your ID was your signet ring. When you were born, you got, you got a, a signet, and then when you, were, when you were 13, you got it presented to you, but you couldn't wear it until it was finally your father authorized it. And now you could carry that signet ring, and that was your authority. 
Well, then people just sign it. No, nobody signed anything. They use their what? Signet ring. Got it? And that's continued. Even when we started off our country, we started off with the signet ring. We left the signet ring when the railroads start coming out. The railroad changed everything. But I want you to understand, this is a sealed scroll. Well, it doesn't look round. If you flatten it out, it looks just like this. Got it? Then you fold it over, and then you tie it so that it can't be opened. You can't peek in the corners. You can't try and read what's written. And then you tie it, and you seal it. You tie it, and you seal it, tie it, and seal it. If it's a legal document, it has three. One, two, three witnesses. If it's a, if it's a document that deals with land deed, how many seals are required? Seven witnesses. Seven what? Seals. Does that word sound familiar? Seven seals. It deals with ownership of land. All right. An inheritance is to be witnessed with seven seals. So here's the verse that we're going to open up, right? And it's in Isaiah 29, 11. And the vision, now I'm going to read this and you listen for things that don't sound right, okay? Or don't, that something's wrong. And the vision of all has come before unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he said, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot. And he says, I am not what? Learned. Does everybody understand? People, I had a person contact me. He goes, Frank, I'm trying to understand the Bible. Your teachings are great. But Isaiah is totally confusing. You can't understand Isaiah without understanding the culture, customs, and what? Figures of speech. Right. Well, we're going to be focusing on the culture. What was it like? Did they have pens and paper like we have today? They had papyrus instead of paper. They may have vellum, which is a, a, a goat skin that scraped and, and made white, and then they use it to make the scrolls with. But that's not what we're talking about. This word book should have been the one that clobbered you, right? Because in the Bible times, there are no books. When... The first book that we call a book, like these, is called a codex, right? Not a, like a Kodak, it's a codex. You know, we're not taking a picture or something. It's a codex, C-O-D-E-X. And now when we go into uh, videos on the internet, you have to apply for a codex, right? Which is the same word, but instead of being that which is a reference material, it's referencing how to handle the video. So it uses the same word. Anyway, the vision. Now, vision is talking about vision that a person has, or is this what God gives? It's God given what? Revelation. It's what God has revealed to you. Of all that is. Now, all, all is, you look at the word all, what do you do with it? It's either all without exception or all without what? Distinction. All right. So, right now in this room, there are, there are, all in this room are four. There's only four in this room. Well, counting myself, I guess five, right? That was dumb. <laughs> all right, what am I talking about? Men. So it's all without what? Distinction. All the men are men qualified without distinction. You see how that works? Though I say all, I'm being distinctive, distinctly on the men. If I said all without exception, we got a lot more. How many do we have? Oh, we, got over, we, we got more than 15, 16, 17, whatever. Okay, but you understand, all without exception means count everything. But with distinction, it's specific. So when the Bible says all, right? Like Jesus says, if I, if I be raised, I will draw all men to me. Well, there's a lot of people that don't accept Christ. There's a lot of people that don't accept the word is truth. So Jesus lied. No, no, no. It's the word all. It means all without what? Distinction. What's the criteria? That they accept the word of God as truth. 
All Scripture, is that all without, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and correction. Is that all without exception or all without distinction? All Scripture means all the Scripture. That's right, without exception. But uh, how many, all, all that are here are five. What am I talking about? Men. So when you read the book of Acts, it says how many people were there. It's not including women and children. And it tells you men. Not that women weren't there, but you've got to understand how that's phrased and what it means. So the vision of all that is. Remember what is is. Is that which becomes part of your what? Reality. Remember I taught you about that. When, when the Bible talks about is, remember, you must know that God what? is. And that usage is so unique. So when it's part of your reality, it's important to you, right? When you heard that there were 20,000 people die when Fukushima, you know, Fukushima um, earthquake and then the corresponding tsunami, 20,000 people died, how many shed a tear? You didn't because you didn't know any of those people. Yet when you come home and you find out your doggy's dying, ah, ah, right? but 20,000 people died, they're not part of your what? Reality. So when we see the word is, it's what is part of your what? Now that perception is called your what? Everybody has a different what? Heart. Your heart is your perception of what? Reality. Got it? I'm gonna, we, we haven't even got past the first verse yet, okay? Right. I'm just reiterating what I've already taught you. How many forgot what I taught you? Or kind of let it slip? Oops, right? <laughs> it's like, oh no. Vision of all, all vision, God's perception, has become unto you as words of a book. The word book should be what? Scroll, right? The codex didn't come in until, what, 12th, 11th century? Yeah. Right? Words of a scroll that is what? Sealed. Which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he said, I cannot, for it is what? Sealed. Why doesn't just break the seal? Because he's what? Learned. Yeah. You don't break a seal, why not? And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. He says, I'm not learned. I can't read it. And that's what's happened to everybody who wants to understand and know God. They're caught in these two situations. My job is to help this, this obstructions between you and God disappear. Is that making sense? Okay. So this section is going to deal with this strange word called sealed. It's not talking about canning. I've heard someone, I have a version that calls it canning. They were canned up. I'm like, no, no, no. It's talking about like an envelope sealed. No, it's not what it's talking about. Not being glued. All right. So what is this word sealed? Now that's going to be our, we're going to focus on the first half on this and then we're going to go into unlearn. Does that make sense? And you're going to grasp the fullness of it and that should bring you closer to God. Okay. So we need to find out the best place to do, have, have, understand the word is where it's been used, what? Before, another location. So in Darius, in Daniel, in Daniel 6, 1 through 5, and it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom a hundred and twenty princes, which should, rule, should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first. Now, this more, Darius is more like a viceroy rather than Cyrus. Cyrus is the ruling king over something that's bigger than Russia and China almost put together. Huge kingdom. So he doesn't really... So we're talking about a sub-kingdom or like a viceroy rulership. So Darius is, all the, the word Darius in, in Persian just means Lord, right? As he's in charge of a, of a great region. So 
because you're going to find that Cyrus was the king, but Darius was one of his viceroys, someone under the blood covenant with him who ruled. Got it? Because the, the king can't be everywhere at once. So he didn't have telephones, didn't have radios, didn't have cell phones, didn't have, you know, uh, computers that, you, you know, with Zoom calls, didn't, didn't have any of that stuff. All right. So you have to have someone who can speak what? For you. Can act what? For you. Someone you trust with your own soul has the same commitment as you. Is that making sense? So the king would set up these people he had a covenant with, and that was Darius. That means Lord. He is the mouthpiece for Sirius. That's why he's called, the word translates in Persian, he who speaks. Right? So, and over these presidents of whom Daniel was first, that princes might give an account unto them, and the king should have no damage. Why? Why? What's the problem here? The king doesn't want any what? Now, why would he do that? Doesn't he trust his own people? No, he trusts Daniel. He doesn't trust the others. Why doesn't he trust them? For the same reason we don't trust politicians. <laughs> There's a problem here, which is what plagued the Persian Empire a lot, especially with those who had Greek influence. But anyway, then this Daniel was preferred above all the presidents and princes because an excellent what? Spirit was in him. And the king, that's, that's Darius, sought to set him over the whole realm. Not the whole, he's not Cyrus, he's Darius, a sub-ruler, right? Is that making sense? Then this Daniel, okay. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find an occasion against him. Now you know why the king was concerned. That they're all power orientated, and Daniel's not. Concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, <coughs> for as much as he was faithful, that's commitment. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and what? He just doesn't, doesn't change. He's very committed to serve who? God. He just ain't quitting. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Now, you get about 100 people looking to find faults in you. How long before they find them? Can you imagine having about 100 people looking over you and everything you do with a fine-tooth comb and a magnifying glass trying to find something wrong? Kind of sounds like what's going through with, with Trump, right? <laughs> Find a fault with him somewhere, right? Well, that's what they're doing to Daniel. They're hitting him with everything but the kitchen sink. But they're coming up with the kitchen sink here shortly. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Ah, one, two, three. Ah, we're going to snag him because he's faithful. He will not deviate. So let's use it what? Against him. Daniel 6, 6 through 11. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said unto him, King Darius, live forever. And that's standard greeting. Doesn't mean it's, they feel that way. All the now hear what they say. Watch all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal decree. Now, by default, that's Daniel. Yes, because it says all. They're lying. They're setting Daniel up. And the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, when you understand, I try to figure out what the, when I see the word den of lions, well, den of lions is something that's out there, not in the kingdom. There's no den of lions when you walk in. If you walked into a den of lions, 
you'd probably be eaten, right? They're, they live in, they, 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 they form little plot prides, and they, then they usually go in a shelter area. And if you walked into it, then your dinner, right? That's all bottom line. But this is in the kingdom itself. So I really wouldn't call it a den. I would call it a prison, an execution, right? We have like the electric chair, the gas chamber, hanging, right? But what they have at this time? Lions, right? The lions. So they would have an underground grotto in which they would throw food down there for the lions. But if there was an execution coming up, they wouldn't feed the, the lions for at least a week, maybe two. So these lions, plural, are really hungry. You don't want to go too far because then they eat each other. But you want them to eat the bad boy, right? You want him to take care of the person that's been... And there's many accounts of it in the Persian law about when a person does a capital offense that they introduce him to the royal lions. I mean, that can be really impressive, right? But anyway, so what happens is that it's kind of like... Um, it's, an, it's, a, it's, it's in there, it's in, the, it's in the ground, and it has a, a bars over it, and there's a, it's, it's got a, a uh, kind of like a fireplace has, a mantle, and it's all got sides on it. So when you close the door, you can lock it. So what happens is that when you want to feed them, like a person, <laughs> you would throw them in there and close it really quickly, because you don't want them to get out and eat you. Right? Like, that's a really bad idea. Whoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thee three days, save thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Which the whole decree is absurd. But nonetheless, the king says, well, the governor said it, and the princes said it, and all the counselors, and all the presidents. You know, obviously, Daniel was part of it, so okay. Now, O king, establish a decree and sign, sign. You and I sign our name. Do they sign their names? No. They use a signet ring. Signet ring goes on this finger. Today, when people get married, they give a ring to each other. It's supposed to be a signet ring. Because back in the 14th century, the first wedding ring given was a signet ring. A man had tremendous lands. He would have a signet ring of his authority on each one of the fingers. He would use that to seal documents. And what he did, because his wife is now his wife, his wife is not his wife, this woman is now his wife, now he gives her one of his what? Signet rings, and now she's in charge of that as his azir. Today we just go, hey, it's a double ring ceremony. No, I missed the whole point. So anyway, <laughs> isn't that, that kind of crazy? All right, so now, okay, establish a decree and signet the writing. That means you pour put clay on it and you make it permanent. That it may not, or you can use wax, but back at this time they use clay. That it be not changed, that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Now what are we trying to do? We're trying to find out what sealed means, right? Well, there's the signet. They translate it signature, which that's not true. But it's a signet. That's your signature. It's your identification. Wherefore, Darius, King Darius, did the stupidest thing you can imagine, rather than checking with Daniel. He signated the writing and the decree. He should have known not to trust them. That's why he brought Daniel in there in the first place. But, so that word there, sign, is signet. Signet ring. It's got your, you impress it into the clay, which comes, becomes a boule. Now, it sounds like a bully, but it's boule. B-U-L-A-E, boule. It's the, it's the clay that has the impression in it. Got it? And we see archaeologists collect. If you look at under, plus or with an I, or an I-A, or an I-E, depending if it's Italian, Spanish, German, English, whatever. But if you look at under seals, you'll find the boule, which is they, they have many of them. Because after documents decay away, all, and the string just decays away, all you've got left is the boule. 
and there used to be an ancient library, but all they found was a whole bunch of brulee because everything just turned to, turned to dust. So they found hundreds of these, but the documents are long since gone, but they still got the bulets. So, King Darius signaled the writing and the decree. That'd be cool if we could find that. <laughs> but all we'd probably have is, you know, Darius's signet. By the way, we have Hezekiah's signet. We have his boule that his personal signet ring did. They found it, I guess, about five years ago. So, that was pretty intense. So, we found a lot of the ancient Israeli kings, you know, boule from their signatures of their signet ring. So it's very, very intense. But Hezekiah's was the best. That was intense. But anyway, we continue on. Now when Daniel knew, now, Dan, now, now stop and think about it. You're Daniel. You've just known they just passed a new law. You can't, now you pray as, as a Jew, as a Hebrew, you pray three times a day. In the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. Three times a day. You never miss it. And if you're in Azir, you always recognize the presence of God and you're serving God. Well, this just came out. Now, he could apply to have it revoked, but he'd have to apply someone higher than Darius, which would then be what? Cyrus. But there's not enough time. He's got less than four hours. So now he's got a real problem. Is he going to not worship God? What would you do? Remember, when the Soviet Union was a communist nation, it's no longer, but when it was, if you prayed to God, they would put you in a gulag. They would actually take you. If you had a Bible, you went to a gulag 20 years. So people say, well, it's not so bad being. If you were Russian during the communist reign, being a Christian, if you had a Bible or even said, God bless you, you were toast. You got a, a special, you know, vacation spot in Siberia. There's an account of when they came in to arrest 20 people. And the guy says, he goes, I either shoot you now. He says, is Christ your Lord? If you say yes, I'm going to shoot you. The guy says, well, then pull the trigger. Christ my Lord. <laughs> And the guy didn't shoot him. He's like, wow. <laughs> and it's, it's some awesome stories during the communist uh, reign. But anyway, so, King, so imagine if that was the law right now. You cannot speak of God. You cannot be caught praying. You cannot have a Bible. What would you do? Now ma imagine you're Daniel here. Because you know he's being what? He's been set up. So... What are they waiting outside the door for? Because you ain't going to miss this. They know he's going to do it. And when he does it, they got him. Of course, this stuff had never happened to me. Never happened to me. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed... He went in to his house, and his windows being opened. He went over there, he goes, you want to watch me pray? Don't want you to miss it. <laughs> Whoa, dude. Wow. <laughs> Man. And when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, pfft. He went into his house, and his windows being opened, and his chamber toward Jerusalem. He knelt down upon his knees three times what? A day. There it is, three times a day. And prayed and gave. He didn't do it once. He didn't do it twice. He did it what? Three times. Make sure you're counting. This is number two. End of the day. By the way, you know what number this is? It's number three. Right? <laughs> it's like, whoa. <laughs> I, I really love him a lot. He's just really a knockout. So, and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. He's not changing because of those dingwas. Then these men assembled. They just happened to be there. Oh, look what we found him doing. Who would have guessed? Right. 
Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making after supplication before his God. Caught him! Boy, we just have him passing by, all 20 of us. <laughs> Sheer coincidence. Bullshit. <laughs> all right, anyway. So what does sealed mean? What does sealed mean? Daniel 6, 12 through 15. Then they came there and spoke before the king concerning the king's decree. Remember, he, what did he do with it? He did what with his signet ring? He sealed it. Came there and spoke before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signated a decree that every man shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast in den of lions? The king answered and said, the thing is true according to the law of Medes and Persians, which altereth not, because he's assuming Daniel was a part of this. Then answered they and said before the king, that Daniel, which is the uh, children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree which thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. We count it. We just happened to be there. We saw him do it once, twice, and three times. We all witnessed it. You can imagine all these, just this whole group just all moving together. Just showed up. Like, yeah, right. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with who? He should have seen it coming. And set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. He is not going to be put to death. No way is he going to be put to death. So he's going to get him out of this. He's the king. He has the authority. He has the power. And he labored. Doesn't mean he worked. That word labor means exhausting everything you got till the going down of the sun. End of time. The sun has come down. The new day begins. Too late. Nothing he could do. He went through all the laws. He went to all the lawyers. He tried to find some way to get Daniel out of this mess. And guess what? Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king established that signated, sealed, may be what? It's done. Unalterable, unrevocable, it's done. And he worked his self, his whole heart. When he talks about labor, it means like a woman giving birth. She's putting her whole heart, soul, mind. He's maximizing his labor here to get, he made that commitment. He's going to save Daniel. And guess what? He can't do it. Why? It's sealed. It's sealed. So what does sealed mean? No one under the authority of the seal may change it. Anyone underneath him can change it? Yeah. Nope. Number two, the authority himself, what? Yeah. Cannot change it. He can't. Daniel 6, 16 through 20. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spoke and said unto Daniel, Thy, now, what's wrong here? He can't do anything. His hands are tied as king. He's totally without any authority or power. And if he does anything, he'll be joining Daniel in the lion's den. And both of them will be dead. So he's, got, he's going to be doing something that is remarkable. And the only person I could say that taught him this would be Daniel. Because Daniel's been with him. Daniel's been, he's learned from Daniel. He's been taught by Daniel. He wanted, he wanted Daniel to be in charge of everything. So whatever Daniel said, he, he listened to him. Now the king spoke and said unto Daniel, Thy God, your God, your God, is it the same God you have? Yes or no? Yes. 
Thy God, whom thou servest continually. How often does Daniel serve God? He's God's what? Azir. He's not serving the king. He serves God and God only. Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Well, how do you know that? Who taught it to him? Daniel did. Now comes the battle. The stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, sealing it, him in there with the lions. And the king sealed it with his own signet. Why? Because it's part of his decree. If he tries to go out of it, he's going to join Daniel. So he has to continue on what he started. Doesn't like it. Laid it upon the mouth, okay, with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords. That's the other witnesses. That the purpose might not change concerning Daniel. It's like there was a lot of time, right? Neither were instruments of music brought before him. What did, they, what did Darius do? He went to his chambers. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want any music. I don't want anything. He's going to stay focused on who? God. He's going to go to God, and he's going to stay with God the whole night, keeping his heart, his soul, and mind focused on God. Neither were instruments of music brought before him. Let's just say he had a really bad heart, and he's like, yeah, I've, I've read accounts on, on, on these commentaries and some of the stuff. They say, well, he had a change of mind. No, he didn't. His mind had never changed. He got tricked. And because of that trick, he wound up almost losing Daniel and his own life. Because he knows if Daniel dies, they're going to be after him so they could hold that position of authority and power. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. So he spent the whole night awake, focusing. How many have ever spent all night in prosuche, right? Focused only on God. How many ever do it for a whole day? All right, how about half a day? The only God is on your thought. By the way, it's the purpose of a Sabbath. The whole day is dedicated to God. Then the king arose, okay, and his sleep went from him. So that whole night, he's pro suche. Remember I taught you what pro suche is presenting all your heart, all your soul, all your mind to God for doctrine, reproof, or what? So the question is, did God find anything wrong with him? What was God's judgment on Daniel? I mean, on Darius? Let's find out. Then the king arose very early in the morning, as the sun comes up, and went in haste. And you can see this guy running down the hallway, his, his, his cloak flying in the background, <laughs> trying to get there as quickly as possible, onto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamented voice. Why is it lamented? What do you think he was doing all night? <laughs> what do you think he was? God, this guy stressed out onto Daniel. He cried with a lamented voice onto Daniel. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, Oh, Daniel, servant of the living God. Living God, living God, living God. Remember I taught you that. Is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Now let's move on to some... No, we want to find out what's going on, right? Then said Daniel on the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me, I had done nothing wrong, and also before thee, O king. So the king, God just says, you had not anything wrong either. The king's like, yeah, it's good. <laughs> That's great. And then the king was exceedingly glad. I can imagine that. Would you be happy? Daniel's just cool. I was just hanging out down there until they opened the door. <laughs> They open it out and he walks out. Isn't that weird that they would throw him into that, certain that he was going to be a pork chop for these guys' dinner. And then the next morning they come out there and they open the door and, you know, the king says, you there? Yeah, I'm here. He goes, open the door, get him out of there. And he said, how would you walk out? Yeah. 
Just cool. Just cool. How would you walk out? Then the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. And no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. Now we have a problem. You see, the purpose of the lion's den is to is capital punishment, to put evildoers to death. And if you throw what you think is an evildoer in there, and he doesn't get killed, then he's innocent. And now whose turn is it to go in there? Those who accused him. Capital punishment. <laughs> the way it's done. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which were accused, had accused Daniel. And they cast them into the den of lions. Them, their children, their wives, and their lions had mastery of them. The lions ruined their whole day. Got it? Broke all their bones in pieces, or ever they came at the bottom of the pit, bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote to all people, nations. He's going to do another signet thing this time. He's going to sign his signet. What is this decree going to say? Well, if you were Darius, what new decree would you give at this point? Then King Darius wrote on all the people, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For reason, he is the living God and steadfast forever. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth. He worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered. I can say that. Yeah, he best and prosper. Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. So here's the reigning king, and here's his sub... like I was explaining to you. So where we learned about seals. No one under authority of the seal may change it. Anything underneath the authority of the person who makes the seal can change it. Yes or no? Everybody got that? All right, number two, the authority himself, who is doing the signeting, cannot what? Can't change it, no matter how hard he tries. Got it? Number three, it can be changed by a higher authority. Yes or no? Now, of course, the higher authority in this situation was who? God. He changed it really quick. So you understand, higher authority can reverse it. Can undo it. Is there anything else? Oh, yeah. One more thing. i to cover one more thing. How many already knew this? You didn't know it? Oh, all right. Okay. All right. So what's the first one? No one can change it. No one under, no, no one under. No one under the authority, whoever signated it, can change it. What's the second one? The person himself who signated it cannot change it. Number three. Only one can change it. It's a one of higher what? Authority. authority. All right. Cool. Now let's go to 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked to the wise man, was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were at Bethlehem. This is a wild ruler, man. He just walked around killing, personally walking around and killing every child. No, he did not. What did he do? He made a decree, and he did what? Signed it one. Every child from two years old and under will be put to death. He's not going to go running around himself do that. He's going to send his, his military out there to do the job. Now, does Rome do this often? Yes, they do it quite often. They butcher out a whole city, whole village. They can do all, whatever they want to. They're in charge. And slew all the children that he had made the what? 
the decree. It was signed, and that's when Joseph and Mary got a new what? Zip code. The angel said, get a new zip code, and they left. Remember that? They didn't say zip code. I'm just saying the angel said, get, you know, yeah. So, according to the time which he had did, inquired of the wise men. Well, how long is this enacted? How long is this for? Yeah, it, does, it has no termination. It's the law. Anyone born at this time, from two years old and under, if you're born at that time, even if you show up later, and they find that you were born at that time, they just kill you. No child born at this time, for, for that time and two years under, is to survive. What's the purpose? Get rid of that which is going to challenge Herod's kingship. The wise man had already said that he was going to be king. And he's like, oh, no, over my dead body. <laughs> so he sent out the decree to make sure every child that was born under two, two years and under was to be put to what? Because he didn't want to lose his position as king. Now, he's not a real king. He's a puppet king by Rome, right? He's not really pro-Jewish at all. He's set up there by the Romans. We don't do that kind of stuff, do we? Okay, just good. I'm just making sure. So then Herod, all right? So Herod signeted. He made that. So if you, if you bring back your child after four years, your child's going to be killed because it was in that time frame. All someone's got to do is say, well, when was your child born? You better prove it. You're going to have to find some way to fake it, but pretty much you know how old the child is. Put him on stilts, maybe. Put a mustache on him. You know, see, he's, he's much older. No, that don't work. All right, so we can see that this was a signated decree, and it takes a signated to put children to death. You understand? Now, in Matthew 2, 19, which is like two verses later, but when Herod was what? Herod was dead. All right? Everybody got that? Herod was what? Dead. dead. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream unto Joseph, vision, not dream, vision, to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. Why? You just sent, you took me, told me to leave two years ago. No, for they are dead, which sought the young child's life. Who died? Herod died. What about his decree? It's, that's right. It died with him. That, that, that seal is only as long as the person who sealed it lives. He's dead. His authority in that seal die what? With him. Is that making sense? Is this important to know? So what does sealed mean? Now again, we're going to go through it. What's sealed mean? May change it, okay. What's number two? All right. Number three? I'm not going to. Only one higher authority can change it. Who's got number four? Yeah. It lasts only as long as that individual who signed it, sealed it, is alive. The moment he's dead, signet is terminated. Got it? The authority of the seal ends upon the death of the authority. Now you're seeing the scope of the word what? Sealed. John 6, 27. Labor not for the meat which per perishes. Meat means what you need to survive, what is important and valuable to you that you make a part of your being. Like when the, the um, when Eve offered Adam the fruit, it's not the fruit, it's not a physical thing, it's the way of thinking, challenging, doubting God, thinking on your own independent way. But, so the meat, right? But for that meat which endureth unto everlasting what? Life. Remember, God is the God of the what? Living. No God, no life. Life comes to a very short end. 
which the Son of Man, that's Jesus, shall give unto you. Well, why, why Jesus? Because for him, God hath, God the Father hath what? Whoa. So what God says Jesus is, is. So what the Word of God says and what God declares about Jesus, number one, what's number one? No one underneath God can challenge it. Number two, only one of higher authority can change it. Oh, man, I'm sorry. The one sealing it cannot what? Change it. And the only one who can change it is one of higher what? There ain't no higher authority than God. But we still got number four. It lasts as long as God exists. You know how long forever is? Yeah. Wow. Now you see how important Jesus is. Nothing can be reversed. Not anything that God says about Jesus can be reversed, undone. So everything God declares about him, God personally has what? Sealed it. Notice I did the word there again. See? You've got to understand all four comp components of a seal. 2 Corinthians 1, chapter, um, chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 21 and 22. Now watch this. Now he, which has established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us, is who? Whoa, 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 whoa. Did I say whoa? Yeah, whoa. <laughs> who also has what? You understand what that means? Everything God has declared concerning you. No one under God can ever what? Change it. Number two, God himself can't what? Change it. Number three, at last, what's the third one? There is no higher authority. And it lasts as long as God exists. It can't be undone. Now he which establishes with you in the anointing, that word Christos means anointing, and hath anointed us. Now that same word there is the same word here. So what's the deal? Well, we're going to call that one anointed and that one Christ. Well, you can do the reverse too. It's okay. It's Christos. It just means anointed. It comes from the word Christos, which means to anoint. Jesus anointed Christ, and he also anointed who? And God sealed that. I know, but I don't have a hard time believing that. That's <laughs> sealed. Can't undo it. You didn't earn it. Christ earned it for you. What do you do? The question is, what are you doing it after you got it? No question, you got it. What if he said, Daniel, come out, and Daniel said, no, I like it in the den. Get your ass out of there. <laughs> You've got to change to accept that covenant. You've got to change to accept that you are sealed and anointed, which is another teaching altogether. Because you've got to realize those four components. God can't change what he's done. No one above, below him can change it, and there's no one higher than him. And it lasts as long as he exists. So God's stuck with you. He's stuck with me too. <laughs> Who has sealed us and given us the earnest. Earnest means down payment. It's only the beginning. It's only a little piece of what's great coming up. Like, whoa. And God sealed it. I think I'm going to faint. <laughs> Is there more? Yeah, seals. 
Ephesians 1, 14 and 14, 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, God's word, the gospel of your salvation, what makes you complete. In whom also, after you pistis, you accepted it and now walked out on it, developing and growing. Ye were what? I'm going to read it, and then you're going to tell me how important the word is. Got it? Holy mackerel. Okay, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In whom ye also, ye is plural. Notice it's plural. Right? It doesn't say thou, it says ye. Ye means plural. Y'all. We go, another way to say it is y'all, right? In whom y'all, right, does that help? Whom y'all trusted after that you heard the word of truth. Can't, it's not a lie, it's permanent, like God's stuck. The gospel, the good news of your salvation, in whom also, after you pistis, accepted that and began to develop and grow, you were what? Sealed. Sealed, yeah! With what? That Holy Spirit of promise. That's God himself sealed it. It has to tell you how many times. It doesn't say God sealed it. Yeah, that's right here. It says right there. It says right there. God sealed it. Which is the earnest, that's the down payment of our inheritance. You're going to get an inheritance? Yes. Why? God's your father. What does God own? That's why there's seven seals. Remember, it's an inheritance. I watch all these other dingwas and I don't even know what they're talking about. All right. See it with that Holy Spirit of promise. Which is... Which is the earnest down payment of our inheritance? It's a token. It's only a part. Until the redemption of the purchased possession. And God says, I, when I get you back, kiddos, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Unto the praise of his glory. God's cool now. You ain't seen nothing. When, he, when we get to be one with him, the best is yet to come. Isn't that cool? Sealed. No touchy. No altar. No mueves. Ninguna parte. So that was sealed. Now, now we're not going to return because every time you read a word, if you don't get the right images, then you got it what? Wrong. You see, when people speak, there's this thing called a... Uh, semantic error, right? Like a person, I may say God to somebody, and I have my images of God, but when they say God, they have a totally different what? Image, that's called semantic error. Because how the word is meant to them is different than mine. Like, remember I told you the two boys, one had a dog, it was a chihuahua, and one had a great Dane. He goes, yeah, I ride my horse. The guy says, I ride my horse. I ride my dog, right? And the guy's thinking, how do you ride a chihuahua? The guy says, well, I, he goes, I sleep with my dog. I ain't going to, he won't even fit in my bed. What are you talking about? He's talking about his great dame. So there's a concept because they got two separate images for the same word. Semantic, thank you, semantic error. All right, so the tree of life is having God's thoughts and images and acting on them. So when you see the word sealed, you know what it means, yes or no? Did God seal Jesus Christ? Yes. yes. Did he seal you? Yes. Can anyone below God change it? No. Can God himself change it? No. Is anyone higher than God? No. And it lasts, it lasts. It lasts as long as God exists. That's a long time. Now you understand why it's called eternal life. Okay. So now we move into the next segment. This is, this is part two, right? What was the one before it? Part one? Come on. All right. Now we go into not learned. What does not learn mean, right? Because what was the excuses of not reading the book? Right. I don't have the authority. All right. And the other one was what? Not learned. 
I can't break the seal, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I, don't, I don't equate. But if you're sealed to God, then yeah, you can read it. The only thing, the other side is being learned. Now we understand what that's talking about. So again, this is a document. It's got three witnesses. Is the word got three witnesses? Yeah, it talks about the four witnesses. Yeah, it speaks of the fourth witness, but it states three. So I think it's kind of interesting. There's God who is witness, Christ who is the witness, and the word. The fourth witness is the inner man where God has placed his spirit in you. You are the fourth witness. All right. That very presence of God in you makes you the fourth witness. Isaiah 29, 11. And remember, I, does this look familiar? All right. So now when you see it, you'd like this is like a really important verse. Isaiah 29, 11. And the vision, that's God's revelation, his truth of all is come unto you. And the words of a what? Scroll, right? Remember, it's a scroll, not a book, right? Is sealed. That is sealed. Which men deliver to one that is learned and saying, read this, I pray thee. And he said, I cannot, for it is what? Well, the word of God is sealed. It's for only those that it is written to. You have to be sealed to be able to read it. And guess what? You are what? Sealed. There you go. It's one of my favorite verses, by the way. Or can't you tell? And he goes, I can't, because I know what the seals mean, and I don't, I'm not authorized. Yeah, I write. right. And the book is delivered unto him that is not learned, saying, read this, and I pray thee. And he says, I can't, because I'm dumber than the bucket of rocks. I'm from Mexico, don't you understand? No, you're going to pull that shit. Now, people have used that on me. That is no excuse. Or Slavic. So now we're going to go into not learned, right? You notice that I'm here helping you what? Learn. Learn. So when you read the Bible, you don't get stupid ideas and images that aren't correct according to God's word. You're not going to be able to say this. You will not say this. Do you understand? Okay. There is the document. Three witnesses. Everything is established by two or more what? Witnesses. There's your witnesses. Okay. Now, let's begin in Mark. Mark chapter 4, verse 11. And he said unto them, his disciples, read it in context, he's talking to his disciples. And he said unto them, unto you, you who? You who? No, it's the disciples. Right. It is given to know. It is given to know the mysteries or the secret of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are what? Without. Who's the ones without? They are not authorized or they are what? Unlearned. All these things are done in parables. The whole Bible is nothing but what? Parables. Similes. When you see the word parable, it means either similes. It could be hypokinostasis as well, but basically they're metaphors and similes, which I cover in figures of speech, the teaching I cover. I cover all three. That reason, here's the purpose, not the reason, the purpose, that seeing they may see. Yeah, I see the word, but they get the wrong what? Images. And hearing... And not what? They get the wrong, they hear, but it's the wrong what? Image. When you saw the word sealed, what was the image you had? <laughs> right? That's not it. You're not licked. <laughs> Least at any time they should be converted. That's that path of growth and, and development. 
because you go from being an, a, a toddler, right, which is different from a tod small, but a toddler, and then you go into adolescence, right? No, you go from there to being a, what's the, from toddler to adolescent, there's one in the middle, it's hellion, okay, there's hellion, and then you go into be, you know, a teenager, and then you go into being a, an, you enter into adulthood, right? Each one takes a level of, how many women here, uh, when you were a little kid, loved candy? Right? And how, what, when, exactly at what point in time did you say, I don't want candy, I want makeup? Well, you'd rather buy makeup than buy candy. Can you pinpoint when that was? What's the matter? And she does both. I'm saying, if you only had. All right, anyway. There was a time when you, we were playing on the swing set and the, and the, and the, the uh, monkey bars and, you know, on the playground. All of a sudden, you see the playground, you're not interested. When did that happen? <laughs> right? Something, you got converted. You got, you developed to the next what? Next level. That's what it's talking about. They should mature. They should grow. And their separation from God. What happens? Because when you're a little mini person, a rug rat, curtain climber, carpet commander, whatever, your understanding of reality in theirs does not match at all. <laughs> and, and they're constantly doing stupid things. How many got little three-year-olds, four-year-olds? Do they ever do any stupid things? They almost kill themselves almost every day, right? You got to watch them like a hawk. Because they don't comprehend reality. They think they've got it all, and they got absolutely nothing. And besides that, they like to throw everything in the toilet and flush it and watch it go down. Mm -hmm. Have you seen my wallet? You've seen my wallet? <laughs> Does everybody understand what I'm talking about? You need to take care of the little mini persons to understand what God goes through with us, right? And their separation from God should be what? Like, how many acted stupid, but now that you're mature, your parents don't... I mean, I remember when I was a little person, you know, I was trying so hard to be adult, and like, you know, you're, you're six years old, you can't be any adult, there's no way. But I'm trying to be adult, right? And, and, and I wet my bed, six years old, and like, oh my God, wet my bed. Now, if I said, let's go visit my mother, and we all went to go see my mother, and she says, hey, I got something to show you. And she reaches back there and pulls out the sheet. Frank did this when he was six years old. Now, that would be weird, wouldn't it? Because that, that should have been what? Forgiven a long time ago. I'm not the same age. I may act like it, but I'm not, right? Does that make sense? <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, here we go. But understand, it should have been forgotten. It should not be broadcasted out. I'm not the same person I was back then. I'm better looking. No, you understand? That was a different me back then. All right. So what is it we got to know when we, before we begin the Bible and just start reading, what is the first thing you got to know? Oh, shoot. What is the first thing? <laughs> All right. Before you even begin reading the Bible, what's the first thing you should know? I know, I showed it to you. All right. Knowing this what? First. first. Before you begin reading anything, know this first, that no prophecy. How much of the Word of God is prophecy? All of it. All, all the book, all the book, all the time, all of it. All right. No prophecy of the Scriptures of any private what? Don't let your brain go off. Brain cells keep falling out my head. That's not what we're talking about. Okay. So we take the word prophecy and we bring it down. Now, what does prophecy mean? It's foretelling the future. No, it's not. It's not true. That's not true. Right? So what does prophecy mean? Well, you know, I can foretell the president's going to get shot or whatever crap. That's not it. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about scripture. Right? It has nothing to do with foretelling the future. The word there is... There's the Greek word, prophetia. 
It means divinely directed speech, declaring or foretelling. Declaring or foretelling. Foretelling is secondary. Declaring is primary. When you are speaking God's word, and it's exactly with the same breath that God himself gave it, then guess what? You're, you're prophesying. I'm sorry, that's the definition. How do I know this? Because if you go to Genesis, Abraham was a prophet, and he didn't foretell anything. He didn't. Show me any place in the Bible where Abraham foretold anything. He never did. He just what? Declared. You declare God's word and you speak it. At that moment, you're in prophetia. And there's a lot of prophets that are in the Bible that didn't foretell anything. They just what? Declared. Well, he didn't prophesy by any about the future. It doesn't discount his prophecy. He spoke for who? Foretelling, declaring, declaring it, not foretelling. That's, that's God's prerogative. When he gets you, gives you to speak, that's what you speak. But if you're trying to help someone understand the word, then God's going to give you the right words to what? Don't use your intellect or emotion. Go by God's guidance. That makes sense? All right. Now, we have the word private. Does anyone have any privates? No, no private. No, wait, that's not what we're talking about. What are we talking about? The word private is the Greek word idios. Now, it's where idiot comes from. Why is it idiot? It doesn't mean idiot. I mean, yeah, it does, but it doesn't. Well, when is a person, when do you think a person is an idiot? What is it they say that you go, oh, what an idiot, right? Did you ever do that? Have you heard anyone open their mouth and say something? You're going, oh, my God, what an idiot, right? What are they saying? They are totally oblivious to reality. And you'll notice that most three-year-olds are in that state. They think they know something, and they know absolutely what? Nothing. Now, if you're 30 years old and you're still speaking like a three-year-old, you really are a idiot, right? <laughs> You lack knowledge, you lack wisdom, you lack a whole bunch of other stuff, right? So private is idios, and what does it mean? It just means one's own. One's own what? Opinion. One's own what? Feelings. One's own what? Whenever a person says, well, that's how I feel, and that's what I think. I don't care. What, what's the truth? Give me the facts. I know that's what the facts say, but no, you're an idiot, right? You understand? They're going by their intellect and their what? Emotions. Emotions. And they make judgments by that. That's a terrible ruler. You got to have a ruler, right? <laughs> Remember when I was in Catholic school? <laughs> Nuns would walk around and go, smack, smack. Smack back in my head. <laughs> so if I ask you, if I put this up there and I say, okay, I want you to measure me seven inches with your fingers, like, you know, between the, the fingers. And I say, do it. And then you would go, okay. And you would go like this. And I walk up with the ruler and I go, okay, let's see. And I'd measure it. I go, nope. Well, it feels it's seven. I think it is. No, the standard tells you. Without the word of God, everybody's going by their what? Their feelings, their intellect, or someone else's feelings. Everybody's running around going, oh, I'm so afraid, or I'm so this, or I'm so that, or I'm so what? Idiot, right? And there's a lot of those, especially those who keep moving their clicker around. All right. Now we got interpretation. What's this? Are you all enjoying this? Is this blushing you? Okay, cool. Because welcome to biblical research. Okay. You got to, like, know this stuff. All right, interpretation. What does that mean? It sounds so academically superior. No, it's not like that at all. Interpretation is very important. It's the word epilysis, which is a conjugation of the Greek word epiluo. And what does that's when someone else is doing it, but the action itself is called epiluo. Epi is upon, luo is to release. To release upon. So I give you a subject. Let's all talk about 
leche flan, right? Well, I don't like leche flan, right? <laughs> Whatever. You know what I'm saying? Whatever I give you the subject on, you let loose on it with your emotions and feelings and what you think. Whenever you let loose upon, it's ethe, luo, ethe, upon, loose. You just let loose on it. How ever had someone let loose on you? Right? You walk in, and you're like, and you're like, oh, I got a feeling I came in at the wrong time. <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> you ever had anyone do that to you? Yeah. They just jump all over your stuff. You don't even know what the hell just happened. Right? That's... <laughs> He's smiling and she's laughing. I don't know about this. <laughs> right. But that's epilis, okay? Epi epiluo or epilisis. Okay. When you release on something, that's when it's talking about them doing it. Well, people do it all the time. As soon as you hit that little emotion button, okay, all right. You understand? Am I right? You ever seen that happen? People just let loose on you? All, the time. All right, so that means let loose upon whatever the subject is. I got to tell I, a, a fool always speaks his mind, just like whatever he feels, whatever he thinks. A wise man keepeth it to afterward. He just keeps his mouth shut. You got two eyes, two ears, one mouth. It's better to engage game, engage game before you in, in, ignite your mouth. Engage brain. Think before you speak. All right, so we understand the importance of this, yes? yes. Right? Knowing this what? First. First. And yet people don't do this before they start reading the Bible. They automatically, they, they just got through talking to somebody, they're watching television, they watch the movies, and they come back to read the Bible, and they're not in the right mood. They read the words, they get the wrong image. They read the words, get the wrong images, and they go, oh, damn it, and just throw it away. I'll put it to the side. you got to be in the state of mind to understand this is not a newspaper you're reading. This is not a magazine. It is the word of who? And the only one authorized to read it are those that are what? Sealed. And they, if they're not sealed, they should keep their hands, their paws, their eyeballs out of it. They have no right to touch it, much less speak about it. You got to go to a bishop's meeting. I went to North America's bishop's meeting because I'm a bishop, right? So I went there. Like maybe 300 showed up. When I showed up, I was going to share about the blood covenant, soul covenant, mental covenant. I thought this would really bless them. They could care less. The only thing I didn't do was yawn in front of my face. <sighs> I was like, whoa. They don't care. So, Mark 4, 1, 9. Now, this is very, very important. What I'm going to show to you is crucial. Can you say crucial? Crucial, crucial right? Mark 4, 1 through 9. And he began again to teach by the seaside. And there was gathered unto him a great multitude. Is it a multitude? Great. No, it's a great multitude. That's a whole bunch of people, right? You can't see the end. That's how many people. So they entered into the ship and sat in the sea. Then what do you need the ship for? It was going to sit in the sea. No, no, no. I know that's what translations say, but that's not what it says. He went and took the ship and sat in the ship in the sea. This is just an error in you know, translation. But. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land so he could address all of them without them being like right in front of his face. And he taught them many things by what? Parables. Now, you can call it parables, but I understand I taught you it's what? Metaphors, right? And similes. And said unto them in his doctrine. What doctrine? The word of what? God. The word of truth. Thank you. He didn't speak outside the word. Hearken. Behold, there went out a sower to sow. What's a sower? One with needle and thread. No, it's not what it's talking about. A sower is one who plants what? All right. Give me a seed. 
Give me a seed. Mango seed. What? Give me a seed. Lemon seed. Okay, give me a seed. Strawberry seed. Those are little tiny things. Give me a seed. Apple. Apple seed. Okay, give me a seed. Pomegranate. Okay. So, the sower went out there to sow pomegranates. He said, first thing comes to your mind. That's called epiluo. You let loose upon it. You think sower, he's sowing seed. And you, obviously, the first thing when I say seed, the first thing pops in your mind is pomegranates. I'm just picking on you. <laughs> or lemon seeds. Or strawberry seeds. You understand the problem? Don't do that. I just got through telling you not to do that. They were not a sower to sow. What's she sowing? It doesn't tell us. And therefore, we don't know. Well, could it be a lemon seed? Could it be an apple seed? Don't let your luo out, right? Keep your luo to yourself. <laughs> Don't throw that stuff out there. Got it? We don't know. Why don't we know? Because it hasn't told us yet. Right? Isn't that simple? Because once he's told us, then we know. But until then, we don't know shit. I don't know, man. I don't know. Got it? Stay humble. Stay meek. And it came to pass as he sowed some fell by the wayside. And the fowls of the air came up. Aha! What's a bird? A bird. Hummingbird. Okay, a hummingbird. Okay. <laughs> give me a bird. Oh, give me a bird. Bird. No, no, no. Aha! Nobody wants to epiluo, huh? I ain't going to be caught with that again, Frank. <laughs> I know what you're doing. All right. <laughs> Don't look. Or no, I'm just joking. All right, so... And it came to pass, he sowed some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured up. Well, we know fowls are what? Birds. And, and, or a pigeon. Or a hummingbird, right? We think of birds. That's not what it says. It doesn't tell us. And if it doesn't tell us, we don't know. And the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Do we know what the seed is yet? Nope. Do we know what kind of birds these are? Nope. Do we even know what a wayside is? No, we don't know what a wayside is. If you saw a wayside, would you know what it is you're looking at? Oh, I know what that is. That's a wayside. <laughs> Got to not do that, all right? All right, so some fell on stony ground. When I say stony ground, what kind of image comes to mind? <laughs> so now we've got two different things, right? We got wayside, right? And we got stony ground. Do we know what these are? They're stony ground. Really? Really? Remember, I'm I'm taking words that you automatically go bing, bing, yeah, I'm letting loose. <laughs> and you just like, you know, vomit all over the word, right? Don't do that with your images. Hold it back. Let the Bible interpret what? Itself. itself. Is this clear? We don't need, we already got 200,000, 20,000 denominations. We don't need any more. And it's all due to private what? Interpretation. Interpretation. The Bible doesn't tell us, guess what? We don't know. Oh, we. Stony ground where it had not much earth. What does the image when earth? I say earth, what comes to mind? Now, interesting. We have a word there. Don't use what you're used to. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. And when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. I say root, what do you think? You see the difference here? 
What are you assuming and what does the word say it is? Because if you're going to be epilouing, epilouing? <laughs> epilouing? That's not a Greek word. I mean, if you're going to be doing the epilouo thing, right? I'm going to do the epilouo thing. No, don't do that. Right? Don't let loose. All right. And some fell among, okay. And it was scorching because it had no root. What's a root? It withered away. And some fell among thorns. Thorns. When I say thorns, what comes to mind? Remember, these all have meanings, but not what you think. When you read the word and you just pop up your own, you're falling, you're being locked out. And it fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. When's the last time you saw a thorn come up there and choke something? <laughs> When's the last time you saw that? Can't be talking about a thorn. Thorn's not, not anything. It's a part of something. See how this is a figure of what? Specifically, metaphors that symbolize something. What do they symbolize? And because it was being choked, it yielded no what? Fruit. And another fell on good ground. What is good ground? What is good ground? Can you see good ground? What does good ground look like? Well, whatever it is, it doesn't look like stony ground. It doesn't, whatever it is, it, whatever it is, it's definitely not stony ground or the wayside or thorny ground. It's good ground. So whatever it is, it's not what the other three are. That's all we got, right? And did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30 and some some 60 and some what? What? 30, 60, 100 what? What? Bananas? Oranges? Grapes? What? Do you see how we automatically want to have pictures there? Our brain doesn't like having no images. Okay, I want you now to all think of nothing. Can't do it. Especially looking at me. <laughs> you can't miss it, right? You can't not stop and think of nothing. Okay, right now, close your eyes. I'm going to give you time. I'm going to say, now, from when I say go, think of nothing. Ready? Go. No, something popped right into your head. I saw everybody's face. Like, oh, ow, oh, ow. Oh. <laughs> Your brain doesn't like standing still. So, but the object is you must control it. So the images, not until Bible, the Bible, the Word of God tells you what those images mean. Don't supply your own images. Got it? I want you to be God's wife. Yes. And he said unto them, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, what does that tell you? Not everybody has ears to hear. Remember what it said? That they hear and not understand. They see and not what? Perceive. He that had ears to hear. Is that everybody? No, it's not. Is it you that has ears to hear? I mean, after Jesus had taught this, how many here would go, excuse me, Jesus, like, I'm really corn-fused here. What the heck are you talking about? Right? This makes absolutely no sense, anything you're saying. How many would do that? Right? Yeah, like, I am totally, <laughs> I mean, I understand that, you know, the greatest stars draw blanks, and I'm just blanking out here, like, oh, what am I supposed to do? 
And when they were alone, they that were about him with the twelve, these are the apostles, disciples, those that are what? Sealed, selected by God, right? With the twelve, asked him the parable. What are you talking about? How many would like to find out what he's talking about? Is it making sense? It's very important because there's two people, there's two groups of people, as you noticed, that cannot receive the word. They feel that they, they, no matter what they read, no matter what they see, it can't, it's not part, they, they, they're not authorized. And therefore, they just give their own. It's not something that's real to them. It's just not there. The other one is the unlearned. And there's lots of unlearned giving their ideas and thoughts. And it's like, psh, doesn't work. So understanding at this point in time, we're trying to understand what this is all about. Because I told you that this is hidden. God has three safeties on his word. This is the major one to keep people out. How many have a lock on your front door? How many have a yard with a gate and the gate's locked? Right? So because you don't want unwanted people in there. Well, the Bible's got the same thing. It's got these boundaries that are locked. And if you don't fit, you will never understand the word. It's designed to keep certain people out. And that's what this is talking about. It's talking about the three, the four types of people. There's the first one, which was one what? Wayside. 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 What's the second one? Stony ground. Stony ground. And what's the third one? Thorns. Thorns. And then there's the good ground. Every time you talk to four people, there'll be one of those four. So that means you're only going to get one good ground out of what? So if you would talk to everybody, like I do, if they stand still, if I catch them in an elevator, <laughs> they got nowhere else to go. And it, pretty much that's the average. So, and there's more to it, but that's just the basic to understand that there's four. Everybody you meet, they're going to be one of those four. And you don't know which one's going to hear the word. You just don't know. All right, so this whole thing is the key to the Bible. Remember I showed you it's the master key. That seeing they may see and not what? Perceive. And hearing they may hear and not what? They, hear, they, they see that they read the word, they get the wrong what? Images. images. They hear the word and they get the wrong what? Images. Mm -hmm. Basically, anytime they should next step of growth and development and their separation from God be non-existent. This is the reason. So we need to understand. Now this is the next verse after that. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? All right. The whole Bible from Genesis to Revelations is written in what? Metaphors. Did I not tell you that? Where do the metaphors begin? What book do they begin at? They're in all of them. For instance, when God said, let there be light, and light became, when did he create the stars and the, and, and the sun? Not, yeah, lots of verses later. So what light is it talking about? If you don't know the word, and you don't understand what God has defined, you will not hear and you will not see. And you will be blind. And he said unto them, Know you not this parable, then how will you know all parables? Well, how many parables are there? They're through the, the whole Bible. Well, if they're all throughout the whole Bible, then I can replace this with the word Bible, the whole word of God. And he said unto them, Know you not this parable? part of the word, then how will you know all of the word? So this is like really crucial. This, this one parable, this one metaphor 
and there's a whole bunch of metaphors in here and compound metaphors. But this one is the key to the whole Bible. If you get this, the whole Bible opens up to you. It's the master key. And unlocks the whole thing. The problem is we default to our own understanding. We default to our own images. And we become blind. Does everybody understand this? This is really crucial. All right. So God is not looking to for everybody. He's looking for one out of what? Four. So you understand how blessed I am to have you here. From now I'll just call you all Juan, because you are the Wands. All right. <laughs> all right. So now we're going to see the explanation, which now opens up that one, but the whole Bible. The sower so with the what? The so the word is as seed. So the metaphor is as seed is, it's not any seed, it's just the principles or precepts of a seed is the way the word is in an individual. Does that make sense? And these are they by the wayside. Now we're going to find out what the definition of a wayside is. Because it, it sounds like, what's a wayside? This is what a wayside is. And you may know some waysiders. That's the kind of thing you do with apple juice, turn it into cider. All right. And these are they by the wayside. These are waysiders. Where the word is sown, you give them the word, easy to understand. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Remember what the original one before said. Those on the wayside it was sown, and what happened? Birds came. So I ask you what bird? It's not a bird. That's what comes and takes it out. So when I say what bird, and you go, well, it's a hummingbird, or it's a uh, seagull, or what? No, no. It's Satan. It says right here. It tells you what the bird is. How many have read this before? Does everybody understand what you were reading? And take away the word that was sown in their what? So now let's look at this. What's the wayside? What is stony ground? What is thorny ground? What is good ground? It's talking about the what? The hearts. The perception of reality. Pardon? Types of hearts. Types of perceptions of reality. And these are likewise which are sown on stony ground. Another type of heart. Another type of perception that someone has to where they will not receive the word. Who, when they heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Praise the Lord. All right. And have no root in themselves. I asked you what a root is. What's a root? Why does a seed produce a root? Why, what is the purpose of a root? When the seed, before it produces the, the little, what's it called, the little um, sp sprout and the leaves, it, starts, it always produces what first? Root. What is the root looking for? Nourishment. 
So that's all I got to do is stick it in the ground and keep looking at it every few days, and I should get a sprout. I need water. But it never mentions that anywhere here. So right now, we're looking at a root. A root. That means it's looking for what? It's thirsty and it's what? Hungry. Remember what Christ talks about? Hungering and thirsting for the what? The word. What do I have here in this room? Those that hunger and thirst. I have people travel all the way from another state which was insanity, and they came here. <laughs> and they came here because they're hungry and thirsty for the work. So what quality of people do I have? The one that the word elevates to the highest point. So, stony ground, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with, oh, praise the Lord, right? <laughs> but have no root. They don't want to learn, and they don't want to understand. And so endure, but for a very short time. Afterward, when affliction. Now, what does it say on the other verse affliction is? What does the verse before say? What is this? What is it calling affliction? What is it sun. called in the other one? Sun. The sun. The sun. In our culture, the sun is everything. In the Bible, the sun is bad. For us, it's good, unless you're living in Arizona. But <laughs> <laughs> after we're gonna, so this is affliction and persecution is the sun. And what does the sun do to you? Scorches you. What is it talking about? Affliction. So when the sun, when you're having affliction, what is that? That's mental pressure. It's called thalipsis in the Greek. It's mental pressure. It's the battle that goes on between your ears. It's the battle that goes on in your heart. It's where you just feel like your whole insides are just battling. Because you know what the word says, and the world will not let you do it. It won't allow you to do it. And the culture, customs, everything wants to force you, in our Greek and Roman culture, to not do the word. And you got to fight it all the way. And that makes a lot of what? Mental pressure. Remember it talks about, for those who gave up your father, your mother, your brother, or sister for the word's sake, shall receive a thousandfold with mental pressure. That word, persecution, is mental pressure. Notice the more people you're trying to help, the more mental pressure you have. Or haven't you noticed that? Just not making sense now. Now you can sit back there and you can look at yourself, okay, I was in the stony ground and now I am no longer in the stony ground, but there's so much other stuff in my life I have to take care of and it's really important that I take care of this. All right, so I haven't got any time or time to, I can't, I don't have any other, you know, other, other, other priorities are more important than the word. What would that be? Afterward, when affliction or persecution rises for the word's sake, immediately, first sign of any problem, any challenge, they are gone. And these are they which are sown among thorns. All right, that's the next group. Who are these? Well, obviously, it's not the wayside. It's not stony ground. Stony ground is when they hear the word, but they... They have no root, no hunger, and what? Thirst. What's this one? They got hunger and thirst, but there's a problem. The roots are being choked, strangled. How many ever try? How many drove a car? Right? How many are comfortable driving a car? Right? Now, if someone was choking you, how well would you be able to drive a car? 
And I'll just, <laughs> don't remind me not to ride with you. Okay. <laughs> but you understand, th this is where the problem comes in. Such as hear the word of God and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of what? I've got to get riches. I've got to get riches. That's the problem. Riches don't make it. There are many people that had tremendous wealth, and it was what? Gone. And we're about to see the wealth of many corporations, individual, that used to be, will now disappear. What we're about to see is something five times worse than ever happened in 2008. The world's not going to be the same. But if you stand on God's word, you have how much to be concerned about? Nada. Make sure you keep that root wet and nourished, okay? All right. And these are they which are among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world. And it doesn't say riches. Riches is what is a byproduct. It's thinking that that is as good or better than God. There's the problem. That's why it's deceitfulness of riches. And the lust. <laughs> no, Frank, no, it's lust. That means just strong desire. And they're so filled with that strong desire, they go, not now, later maybe, but not now. This is more important yeah. to me. Does that sound familiar? Enter in and choke the word. So the word's taking root. It's getting water. It's getting nourishment. But. The other things are taking all the nourishment and water. It's taking, there is no time. I remember when I first told my wife, I said, oh, hey, wife. No, I said, <laughs> I told her, you're going to wake up in the morning, and you're going to start with the word of God. And you're going to go through your affirmations, and you're going to stay in there every day. And before you go to bed, you're going to do it again. Oh, she wanted to, after I told her. <laughs> I want to do that. But you see what happens if you don't, if you're away from something, and then you get used to being away from it, then you go a little bit away, more away from it, then you keep going. Pretty soon you don't even realize that you... Understand, it's kind of like a, a course, right? If you've ever been on a ship, the, the, the ship has a course. If you deviate just 2% or 3%, at first it's not too bad. But as you continue, the distance is too far. You may start off, say, well, it's only a little bit. It's only a little, and eventually it's overwhelming. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about? And you'll see that these, they were sown among thorns. That means they have water, they have nourishment but they have other things that are equally as important or more important. Is that making sense? Such as hear the word of God, and that word here means yes, right? They got the word, they got the images, but, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it, the word of God, becomes unfruitful. It doesn't come to pass what it says. They choked it. They strangled it. Notice it's about people, their hearts, their perception of reality, how their lives are defined. And these are they which are sown on good ground. Why well, I'm so blessed to have you here. Such as hear the word of God, same as the one with among thorns. How many had other things they could have done today? How many had other people demanding your time? How many sit there saying, you must do this and you must do that? And you're like, nope. And this became your priority today. Well, I've got you listed here. You're on the list. You're right here. I wouldn't call it the bottom 
<laughs> God saves the best for last, okay? All right. And these are they which are sown on good ground, good hearts, good, excellent perception of what? Reality. Such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth what? Fruit. I think I'm bringing forth a banana. Oh, no. Oh, it's time for the pineapple. No, don't. That's not what it's talking about. What, what are we talking about? How do you bring forth fruit? What does the fruit of an apple tree bring forth when the seeds? More apple trees. More of its kind. Can you imagine another Pablo here? Can you imagine another Mariposa? Another Michelle? Do you understand how cool this is? I'm striving to bring forth another Dickie Tulak, right? <laughs> you understand? There's got to be another person like me out there that I can fire him up and I go, yeah, he's just like you. I've got there yet. Who knows? It may be any one of you, right? Someone who can rise up and say, yes, mm, I got it. See it? That's what God is looking for. Well, how old do you got to be? David was 17. How many have reached 17 yet? Oh, yeah, Samuel was 12. So don't tell me age has anything to do with this. Is this cool? And this is what nobody sees because they can't. But you see it. Now you understand the nourishment is more and more understanding of God's word. But you need to have Whose images? Guess what the metaphor for God's images is? Water. It's not mentioned here. Let's go to Isaiah. This is a, I wasn't going to share it with you, but I'm going to do it anyway. So dare. So there's two things that make God's word important. Things that God says is important, and that which he says these are important, and the thing he does not mention but goes around, that's what it's it's that which is not said, which is more important. That which is hidden. And what's being hidden here is water. What's being hidden here is water. So let's go to Isaiah. Chapter 55. Now listen carefully, keep in mind, keep in mind what I just taught you. All right, so chapter 55, verse 8, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Ah, one, two, three, ah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than what? Your ways. What makes us act the way we do? Our perception of reality, our hearts. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my what? Thoughts. Than your thoughts. Reason. For is reason. For as the rain. What is this a metaphor? It just explained it in verse 2. As the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven. What does the snow and the rain have in common? They're not contaminated by anything of the earth. They come right from the sky. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not ether. Have you ever seen snow go upward? Or rain go upward? No, it don't. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, 
it waters the what? Earth to bring forth and what? What gets brought forth and buds? The seeds. And maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give what? Seed, Seed to the who? Sower. Sower. And bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. Did God signet your life? Did he tell you what you can do, what you're authorized to do, what he has destined you to do? All you got to do is walk out on it. And it shall prosper on the thing whereunto I what? Sent it. You send every communication with a what? Seal. And this is God's communication to you. I'm watering that seed as best I can. I'm nourishing it as best I can. I hope you're enjoying the nourishment. Anyone here get your what did, did I nourish your root and water it for you? Yeah. I hope so. Okay. I'm speaking metaphorically, okay. Ah. All right, here we go. <laughs> Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. Now watch, now watch the usage of the words with the metaphors you've now learned. Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. Purpose. That Christ, that anointing, the word is Christos, that Christ may dwell in your perception. That anointing may be a part of your what? Reality. What is for you? By Pistis, that's growth and development. That's your goal. Remember, David was able to take on Goliath, take on the lion, the bear, and Goliath, because that was his what? He could prove God that he truly was what God said he was and what he could what? Do. That ye being rooted and grounded in what? Agape, seeing God's priority, God's perspective, God's values may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Where does the power of God limited? It's not. And if he dwells in you, where are you limited? You're not. How old was Samuel? Twelve. Started off as a man of God. All right, and to know, that's experience. You can have it up here, but until you experience it, it's not real to you. But if it's what you're doing, like David, I am anointed king of Israel. I am anointed, and God sealed that. So he acted on that lion. He acted on that bear, and he acted on Goliath. And what was the result? God's word came to what? Pass. Are you anointed? Yes. I read it to you out of 2 Corinthians. Are you sealed? Yes. I read it to you out of 2 Corinthians. Are you not the dwelling place of God? I read it to you before. And to know experientially the agape that Christ has. Why? Because there's no difference between you and him. He just has more agape, more of God's images, God's thoughts, God's priorities, and God's purposes. Which passes, go passes, pa like when you pat, you're driving your car and you pass the other car, it passes knowledge. You just pass right by knowledge. You're just like, pff, way beyond just simple knowledge. Because it's a perception, it's a reality, it's a comprehension. Why? Why is this so important? What's the purpose? That ye be what? Filled. Play a role. No. Play though. Overflowing. With what? Salsa. No. Overflowing with what? 
chilies. No. Overflowing with all the fullness of God. How is that possible? Because you got God's thoughts, God's images, God's priorities. See from God's perspective. Gives through three guesses. Where's God? With you. You don't spend time with people who don't think like you hold your priorities. You don't. But boy, if someone thinks like you, has your priorities, and sees to things the way you do, just like all of a sudden you're going, how you doing? You, know, you just slide on over to them. You're supposed to be filled with all the fullness of what? Whoa. Oh. Wow. Ready? One, two, three. Wow. I didn't write this book. It just blows my socks off. You know what I'm saying? No, I'm just joking. All right. Just the thought of it's making the verse bigger. <laughs> and we even underlined it for you. <laughs> you can't miss it. How about John, chapter 8, verse 31 and 32? No, oh, Frank, I can't handle it anymore. Yeah, you can. You're good ground. You're good ground. All right. Repeat after me. I am good ground. Ready? Go. I am good ground. That's right. We're not talking coffee here. We're talking, you know. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. If... Ye, plural, continue in my what? Word. Nourishing God's images, God's thoughts, seeing from God's perspective, acting on it with God's authority, God's power. Oh, just the shit will just get out of your way. Nothing's going to stop you. You can't be religious with God. It doesn't work. But you can be godly with God. And he won't ever leave you. Does that make any sense? If you continue my word, then you are you my disciples. What? Indeed. That's the salt covenant and the beginning of the mantle. I haven't even touched the blood yet. There's levels, just like elementary school, junior high school, high school, and college. What level are you? What level of commitment are you? Can't expect good ground to produce seed the moment you pop it in. It takes a while. Lots of water, nourishment. Then just get out of the way. And before it, wow, all right, you, know, you never know. If you continue in my word, don't quit. Don't let nothing take it away from you. Don't slide into the, the birds. Don't let the sun scorch you. You understand the problem here? Don't let your heart be horn, scorn, horn, stony. <laughs> if you continue my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall. It's you're going to learn and understand the what? The truth. And the more truth you have, the more you are what? Free. Free from all the lies free from all the distortions, free from all the things that suck the life out of people. The truth shall make you free. You will have the fullness of God in you. I think that's a pretty good deal. I thought I'd underline it too. Ready? I'll read this with me. Right? If ye continue in my word. Well, whose word is it? Jesus or God's? Pretty soon it's going to be your word, yes? Then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. One day, someone's going to pick up a dictionary. You're going to look under the word awesome and going to see your picture. Isaiah 29, 11. If not, that's okay, because God's got your picture. 
Isaiah 29, 11. And the vision of all the greatness, the fullness, the beauty, the majesty is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned and saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is what? Sealed. And you find all these great academics, there's no way to understand what the Bible's talking about. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he says, I can't. I don't understand any of it. These are both bad ground. You are the third alternative here. You're the one that God looks for. Everything the word says about you, you are bringing to pass. Even being here. You are God's anointed. You are God's sealed. And everything God has given to Christ is given. And he, then he sealed it. He sealed it. Remember? What does seal mean? If God sealed it concerning Christ, what God can seal concerning you? Understand, again, back to seal, because that's what we're talking about. Seal. What does seal mean? No one below it can what? Can change it. What's number two? God himself cannot change it. What's number three? It can only be changed by, and who's higher than God? And the fourth is, it only is good until the death of the authority. And God ain't dying. I'd say you're pretty valuable. Do you not believe me? That's sealed and not learned. It is the true way of life. Ready? Has it been a pleasure to have you here? Yes. The answer is yes. The word says, how oh, beautiful are the feet. All right, so you got pretty feet. So I can just say you're just beautiful. Okay? I'm good. You are God's what? Yes. Oh, I love you. <laughs>